Hi, and welcome to my review of Queen's album, A Night at the Opera. Now, for those few of you who aren't really familiar with Queen, they're a British rock band uh, that have a, a very unique and very uh, a recognizable uh, sound to them. It's characterized by mainly being uh, electric guitar and piano, but they also have a very wide range of instrumentation, from strings to bringing in harps and weird stuff like that. Their musical style um, is almost like modern version of classical music um, in that it involves a lot of intricate melodies and uh, has, a, has a sort of majestic choir backup vocals. But the one thing, maybe the most iconic uh, thing in the sound of Queen is the lead vocalist Freddie Mercury. Freddie really cannot be overstated as a singer. He is fantastic. Uh, he claims to have had no formal vocal training, and yet he sounds like he, uh, you know, has this great operatic voice with huge range and total clarity. But he can also bring it down and do the, the sort of guttural, uh, a dirty sort of rock sound. It's interesting because it makes it so that with any Queen song, with any Queen album, uh, anybody else that covers it just can't capture that same greatness that Queen did because of Freddie Mercury's amazing vocal performance. And it's also what makes uh, whenever you, somebody tries to sing along with Queen in the car that there's bound to be a point in the song where they just can't sing anymore because it's Freddie Mercury singing and you can't sing like Freddie Mercury. He can be intense and he can be beautiful and he can be delicate and he can be strong. It's, he's, he's the complete package. And we'll find that this album really brings in his whole repertoire as well as Queen's and stretches uh, the limits of of what he does, and what Queen the band does, in fact. This album, in fact, feels kind of like a showcase of Queen. It's not a greatest hits at all, uh, but it definitely goes from one end of the spectrum of their music to the other, and it surprises you. You just don't know what's coming next on the album, because everything seems to be so different. So the album opens on Death on Two Legs, which is kind of an angry metal song directed at one of Queen's crap uh, managers. <laughs> it's a song that sort of gets you pumped and excited, but that song gets into its climax, and uh, right when you think it's gonna you know, have this uh, big, bold ending, it just cuts short, and without a second to breathe, um, it jumps into the next little song. And I tell you, it could not be any more different than what you were just listening to. It comes into Lazing on a Sunday Afternoon, which is a bouncy little vaudeville sort of show tune. I mean, it was such a stark contrast between the first and the second song, it almost feels like the second one's supposed to be a joke. But it's done so technically well that you realize, no, no, this, this can't be a joke at all. This is uh, perfected and performed. And so you keep listening, and the next song on the album feels like just as much of a joke. It's called I'm In Love With My Car, and it's actually one of the better known Queen songs. It's a really catchy rock song that has very clever use of car sounds, but you have to think about it. This isn't some weird metaphor or something like that. It's just a guy singing about how he loves his car more than a woman. Let's see what's next. It is You're My Best Friend which sounds cliche and kind of is. It's just kind of a feel-good pop song. Um, it's probably the one that's most immediately catchy, but compared to the rest of the album, after you've heard it all and listened to it a few times, this one becomes the boring one of the set. Where everything else in the album is very uh, technically intricate and interesting, uh, this one gets boring real quick because it feels, well, generic. The next song is 39, as in the year 39. If you listen to the lyrics, you realize it's a 39 that hasn't happened yet because it's about a group of people that go out into space on a rocket ship. So it's kind of a quirky little sci-fi song, uh, except that it's not a rock song, it's not one of those funny vaudeville show tunes, it's like a folk song. It has kind of smoky singing and an acoustic guitar sound that, I don't know, makes it seem sort of like a protest song or something. But it's not, and that's weird. And there's kind of this juxtaposition of what it sounds like and what it says that seem to be opposite from another. Then uh, Side A is finished with two more songs that mirror the beginning of the album, uh, where you have the metal song, Sweet Lady, and then when it's over, the scales tip all the way the other way to Seaside Rendezvous, which is just as cute a song as it sounds. And that's the end of Side A. So they bring in the Prophet song, which is Queen's longest song at eight minutes long. Whoa, that all rhymed. Uh, side B starts really slow and takes a while to build up with its uh, little acoustic guitar and vocals intro, but it does get big and explodes into an almost uncomfortable sort of music sound. It's very heavy on the downbeats with drums and electric guitar, and feels almost like impending doom or something like that. But then right in the middle of the song, at about the three minute mark, uh, it cuts to Freddie Mercury singing by himself, only on loop. And he starts to sing basically around with himself, uh, that goes in and out of harmony and dissonance in really a strange, unsettling way. But then it builds to this really pretty part where he's doing this la-la-la sort of round with himself that sounds 
fantastic and beautiful. This song is mesmerizing and both eerie and beautiful at the same time, which is kind of a strange combination. And I feel like it's kind of an acquired taste, that at first it's very off-putting that things feel like they don't mesh together in the correct way. But in fact, they mesh together in a very intricate way. It's kind of like uh, looking very up close to a pattern, and as you back away, uh, you can really see the full picture. I don't know, I'm no music major or theorist or anything, uh, but I found that over time this song becomes uh, maybe the most interesting one on the album. So the Prophet's song is over and we come into a ballad, Love of My Life. It's okay, it's a ballad, it's kind of boring, I'm not going to say anything about it. The next song is Good Company, which features ukulele and is a weird little sort of moral story, actually. It's very upbeat and cute, uh, but it's actually about a really sad story about a man that basically gets too involved with work and loses all his friends and family. Kind of like 39 on side A, if you listen to the song passively or actively, you get two very different experiences. And then boom! In comes the big guns, Bohemian Rhapsody, which is probably the song the Queen is best known for. You know, it was in Wayne's World and on Glee and all this other stuff, it's uh, very popular. And for good reason, because like the album, it really embodies the spirit of Queen. And although Bohemian Rhapsody actually has this really nice, cathartic, little soft, melancholy ending to it, um, they actually wrap up the album with God Saves the Queen, an instrumental version, in fact. But you know what? They can do what they want, and frankly, that's kind of what the whole album feels like. Unlike a lot of albums where you feel like uh, it's full of metaphor or political messages or something, uh, Queen's on Night at the Opera just feels like they sat around and said, hey, this sounds like something fun to play, and then they did it. It borders on the range of silly at times, but it really just feels like they, they're not actually confined with any boundaries. In fact, this whole idea of they do whatever they feel like uh, is even apparent in the title itself. A Night at the Opera was the name of a film that they happened to be watching one night while they were recording. But that doesn't take away that this is an album of extremities, of opposites juxtaposed against each other, and it's done in a very musical, in a very technically proficient way, as all of Queen's work really is. And really, for that reason, this album deserves a listen. Now, whether or not it happens to be in your musical taste or not, um, you will still find this album to be technically fantastic, and uh, undoubtedly creative and unique. Thanks.